I wasn't me anymore. I went through a very, very dark time. My confidence was shot to pieces. Everything I did was wrong. People didn't want to hear this story and they never do with bullying. What does that feel like? Dyslexia, a challenge, he managed to turn it into a strength. And as an avid runner and a career path stunner, he knows how to finish the length. Where I struck my dyslexia was a disadvantage. Where I flourished the best is where I'm building businesses and that's a strength having dyslexia because you can see all the joins and you can work out how you navigate an organisation. And you've scaled businesses at very large organisations, some of the yep. biggest in the world, Sky, Apple, Amazon, and now Uber. But how did the opportunity at Uber come about? Greetings, I'm Ashley Samuels McKenzie. And I'm Charles Parkinson. And welcome to How I Became. Where we unveil the unscripted journeys of inspirational figures. If you enjoy the show, could you do one thing? Subscribe. Wherever you are, just click the subscribe or follow button. That simple act can help us grow the podcast in a big way. And we need your support to do it. And if you really want to help play a part in our growth, rate us on Spotify or leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It would mean the world. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Uber, shaping the future for consumers as they go anywhere and get anything. Advertising on Uber connects brands with hundreds of millions of people using Uber around the world in the moments that move them most. To learn more about what we can do for your brand, visit uber.com forward slash advertising. Hi, I'm Paul Wright, and this is how I became head of advertising in the UK for Uber. Living his younger years in a boarding school run by his parents, he experienced life within shades of contrast. Adapting to such different upbringings seems to have bolstered his mind to be on task. Dyslexia, a challenge he managed to turn it into a strength. And as an avid runner and a career path stunner, he knows how to finish the lengths. <laughs> Learning the ropes in television when Sky was a startup venture, to then working in the biggest tech companies with boatloads of stories and adventures. He's had a myriad of roles. Some of them we'll delve deeper in today. Introducing Paul Wright, the head of Uber Advertising UK. Thank you. Yeah, hey, welcome. Thank you. There you go, your life in a poem. Yeah, indeed, yeah, it's quite, that's quite weird. Yeah. <laughs> but nice, that's really good, thank you. Uh, so today we're gonna learn about how to, how to scale businesses yep. within organizations and outside of organizations you've done both you've mm -hmm. co-founded founded companies yep. you've been a consultant mm -hmm. and you've scaled businesses at all at very large organizations some of the yep. biggest in the world most successful ever sky apple amazon and now uber mm -hmm. uh, so that's what our audience are in in store for is is great advice from an expert on scaling businesses and uh and being an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur yeah people so. have heard yeah. of entrepreneurship what about entrepreneurship? We've got a definition here. Entrepreneur is an employee who is tasked with developing an innovative idea within a company and can draw on its resources to do so. I think that's fair. That's a reasonable way of describing it. It's quite an interesting, it's quite interesting. We don't really have a big discussion around it. We have all these, these icons who are entrepreneurs, but we don't really talk about entrepreneurs at all. And actually for companies to survive, entrepreneurship is often vital mm -hmm. because that's how you reinvent the company from a to b as as technology and everything else changes so it's a, it's an interesting thing that's missing i don't know quite why that is no not sure but if someone is interested in it or maybe they they are one and mm -hmm. they want to learn some great strategies on it um we're going to delve into all sure. of that today which is going to be really interesting in terms of how to build teams how to set a strategy um, and how to scale. So you're head of Uber Ads. Mm -hmm. What is it? What's Uber Ads? Uber, over the last few years, has built ad an ad business around various things that we need for our consumers. So you've got two apps. You've got the Uber Eats app, which is obviously delivery of food and convenience delivery of groceries. When people go on there, most people if you're like me, I'm not sure what you're going to order, but you know you're going to make an order. Mm -hmm. 
So therefore, what comes up in your feed is very important because it will help you make a decision about whether it's an order from Waitrose or whether you want Pizza Express. It's a bit like going on Netflix. You go on it, you don't yeah. know what you're going to watch. Yeah. <laughs> so our, our our main app, our major app platform is the, is the ability for those brands to make sure that they're in they're high up in the feed mm. through our sponsor listings product so it's a sponsored listings business yeah essentially and that's important for all things and there's very clear benefits there and then you know a brand can particularly tar target according to the location you're at in terms of you know this brand's available here or whatever so that's the first part of the business and that's where the heritage of the business has been and then we've expanded into two other areas one is working with the fast moving consumer good category a lot of which sell on uber so whether they're ice creams that you buy with your pizza or whether it's ice creams you buy through a convenience delivery partner um or it's chocolates or it's whatever whatever brands you you call into that category and we have a variety of products that we we develop for them um and that's good um and that's growing and then the final area is what we do in our ride side of the business, which is the Uber rides, which you will know. So what we're doing now is placing ads into the app experience as you are booking booking and riding in a car, which is using some things like location data. So if you're going to Heathrow or if you're going to uh, JFK, then you know we know that you're going there. So therefore, what advertising opportunities could we could provide there which are non-interruptive and this is really important the user experience has to be good non-interruptive but maybe beneficial to you so we have brands for example doing targeting of people going to duty free because we know you're going to go through duty free and maybe want to buy a perfume and here's a promotion for a pro perfume mm, i see or sunglasses sunglasses or, yeah. Yeah. or, so or if people are going to restaurants or if they're going to bars or if they're going to hotels or if they're going to transport hubs those types of data points are quite interesting and therefore quite powerful. And those ads are really unusual because they're getting very, very high attention rates. We only show one advertiser per trip. Okay. So you know, it's not like your, in your normal internet experiences, you can see many multiple ads every time you go on a page, as you know, but one advertiser per trip. So it's quite premium. In that so when you're standing there for five minutes waiting, you see it. Yes. And when you sat in the it's the same advertiser all the way through. We have slightly different units for different stages of the journey. Mm -hmm. um, but I was looking at one campaign the other day, and I think it had something like 230 seconds of engagement time. So the, the ad was seen for that long yeah. period of time. Now, in a world where there is a load of distractions, the number of ads that everyone sees is, I don't know, 3,000 a day or something crazy. Our belief is that advertisers want moments where there is time to engage that's not distracted i see and uh we're getting some great great feedback on that and it's at early stages and you know we're we're building the team around that and then obviously a lot of our restaurant partners use it as well and a lot of our convenience partners on our cpg partners fmcg partners do it as well so so we have all these different services and what we're building is a sort of ecosystem within the uber environment of advertising but again not intrusive in a way that you'd expect from say a publisher or whatever because ultimately we're not you know logistics organization operations company that delivers things to people gets gets you know delivers things to people takes people to places i see okay so when you next choose your favorite restaurant because it was promoted on the app you can thank uber <laughs> thank you for roads possibly or find your favorite new perfume on the way to the airport yep there you go let's dive into where it all begins mm -hmm. So you had a very interesting upbringing mm -hmm. where you had to share your parents. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell us a bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so, so it's quite an odd, uh, old, odd story. I guess, so I, uh, my dad originally was originally a clergyman and ended up working in public schools as a chaplain, which was fine, and that was a relatively normal existence. And we, we started in workshop in up, up in the Nottinghamshire uh, coalfields. And then we came down to a place called Morven, which is a beautiful part of the world. Highly recommend if you want a lovely weekend away. It's a beautiful place. Um, and where, anyway, sorry, so where is it for anybody outside the UK? Mor so anyone it? outside the UK, it's sort of below Birmingham on the way to Wales, I guess, is the way of thinking about it. And it's where Elgar was and C.S. Lewis 
was 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 um was there and Tolkien was there and various other things. So wow. There's a lot of mm. it is the sort of shires of the Lord of the Rings. We were talking oh, about. yeah. So, so so the Lord of the Rings would have been inspired almost by this area. Yes, it would have been wow. uh, because okay. it was a sort of the green and pleasant lands of England, I guess, in that sense. Um, it's a beautiful place, and um, Morven has a, had a bit of a reputation for having lots and lots of private schools because it was originally a spa town. And in the Victorian age, and therefore became, had the lots of schools that went with it. And these schools, one of the schools was Morven College, which is where my dad became chaplain. And then he was then asked to become a head of a boarding house. There were like 10 houses, which were originally, you know, fantastically called number one to number 10. I mean, they were, they, <laughs> it's a bit like a sort of episode of The Prisoner, but not <laughs> weirder. Um, and each house had about 60 kids in um, that were being looked after from the ages of, I think 13 to 18. So I, I lived in, we moved into this house, this old Victorian house, which had dormitories and all this, and facilities on one side. And then we lived on the other side in a sort of private area with doors that connected us to this other house. And my dad ran, was a teacher at the school, but also ran the house and running the house was quite a lot of work as you imagine if you put you know 60 boys from the age of 13 to 18 together and they're all living together and whatever that's quite interesting um it's going through their development as as teenagers into adults and then my mum ran the house so she was like the the I suppose she was like the major d to some degree I, she will hate me saying that but <laughs> but she really was the person who ran the whole house and made it work and made sure that the kitchens were because there was there was kitchens and there was cookers and cooks and cleaners and all sorts of things that were were there so she ran the house so I was sharing I mean you know, me and my sister were sort of sharing our parents with this, <laughs> these other kids which was sort of weird and then I went to school uh, about 10 miles away in, in Worcester um, so I um, sort of had this weird thing so I went to school and then came back to a school which was sort of slightly 24 7 school yeah it's not really really schooling. I mean they, they, you know um, it was fun in the holidays because obviously you then had the run of the the the, the school to yourself so wow big garden big garden <laughs> and you know the ability to go to the gym and the swimming pool and all the other facilities they had at the school which oh, was fantastic nice. so it was it was wonderful in some ways but it was a very unusual existence I think mm -hmm. when you're growing up how interesting. So you're, you have this interesting, you know, upbringing in the yep. world of um, world of school. Um, then you enter the world of work and you don't start in that world of advertising. <laughs> far from it. No, far from it. I've started in the right or the other side. So I, I left um, when I was 18 um, and went to UCL and did geography at UCL because that was sort of uh, a great course to do. It's a fantastic university. And then I came out looking for a job and there was a thing back then called the milk round, which I don't know that people probably don't recognize these days because the principle of the milk round is that people were sort of collecting candidates before they completed their, their exams and various companies would come in and try and get the best candidates for their jobs. And I got offered a job working for Lloyds Bank, which I, in my heart of hearts, I, I pretty much knew wasn't going to be my long term <laughs> career plan. But it was a management leadership course uh, program, and it was all quite good, supposedly. So I went to Lloyd's, um, and the, uh, the branch I started at, and you had to start at a branch on these places. It wasn't like you, you were set into some big sort of, you know, central office. Mm. You started in a branch. And the first job I had was to put checks into alphabetical order which I have to say is a fairly mind-numbing job, um, and now done by machines, thank goodness. But, you know, we had to basically do it by a certain time of the day so they would then get processed through the system. Right. And this was down in the basement of Lloyds Bank in Bake Street, which is actually still there. So that was the first part of the job, and I was like, this is crazy. I'm really not liking this. And then I, I gradually moved upstairs, which is a great progress because you were in the darkness of <laughs> downstairs, and then you moved upstairs. And I moved upstairs into the cashier's area. I was a cashier for a bit. And then I also worked on uh, loans and mortgages just at the time this was when interest rates were going shooting through the roof. So not too dissimilar for now, mm -hmm. which was quite challenging. And I had a friend from university who is a guy called Tom Heap, who um, is an environmental correspondent for Sky and various other people now. And I went to dinner at his place because I'd been dumped by a girlfriend. And he sort of said, come around and have a chat. 
um, and there were various people there. And he'd start started working at this company called Sky Channel, which I'd not really heard of. It was a cable TV network um, showing repeats of Spider Man and various other things and WWE. So I was like, a TV company called Sky Channel. Anyway, he started talking about it, and he said, "Look." Uh, to one of the people at the t dinner, well, not to me, they're looking for ad salespeople. And I'm like, that sounds quite interesting. And the person he pointed it to, she she wasn't interested. And I said, Tom, actually, this could be quite interesting. Would you put my name forward? And he said, yeah, sure. And so about a couple of weeks later, um, I got a phone call to come for an interview. Now, You've got to remember, these are, there's no emails or anything this time, back mm. in this time. So you had this thing where you had to communicate with people by letter or phone call, which was always quite challenging. And then I was asked to go down to um, a street uh, just off Great Titchfield Street called Ogle Street for an interview. And I went into this building and it was formerly the office of the News of the World magazine. Um, okay. And we, I mean, you just went in there and it looked completely run down. And then they said that, well, we're looking for salespeople. And I sort of ended up meeting the guy who ran sales, which was a guy, Canadian guy called Kirk McPherson. And he said, well, we're looking for these junior guys. Would you like to come and do this? And I'm like, okay, sounds quite interesting. And I had no idea what I was walking into. Mm. But what I was walking into is probably the biggest revolution TV we had in this country, actually. Mm. And but it was I, just a sort of startup at this point. Basically, what happened, Murdoch had bought it after it run for a couple of years as a sort of pan European cable network distributor. Mm -hmm. So it was distributing um, a channel called Sky Channel to about 300,000 homes across Europe through cable networks as they were then. Murdoch bought it and decided he was going to turn it into what became Sky TV, which was going to be a satellite distribution network rather than a cable one. Mm -hmm. So when Sky launched in 1989, we launched with four channels, which was uh, Disney, Sky News, Eurosport, and Sky One, I think. Those mm. were the channels that launched. That had gone from basically what Sky Channel was, was one smorgasbord of content to something like that. And that was quite a big move. And he obviously put a lot of money into investing into satellite dish technology because that was a quicker way of getting distribution, particularly in the UK, because cable distribution in the UK was a complete mess at the time. There was lots of very small cable networks, and they had restrictions on the amount of channels they could take. Yeah, so I walked into this ridiculously weird job which was we're going to run this ad sales team we're going to sell more advertising than we currently do and you're going to be a sales assistant and that's your appren apprenticeship so fun <laughs> 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 but very crazy as it progressed through so i'm interested to hear this is a company you would spend the next 10 years at yep and a bit more after that and we'll, well yeah that. there's another bit yeah, yeah yeah this is two parts of the sky journey but um and you would later sell your company to Sky. Okay, yes. So, uh, but we'll get to that story of selling it. What what can people learn? Because you saw Sky go on this journey from smaller company to yeah. one of Much the biggest bigger, yeah. you know, TV companies in the world. What can people learn about how to scale and how not to scale companies <laughs> based on Sky's journey? I mean, Sky's journey was very bumpy. Um, and I think there are books about how close Murdoch actually became to going bust on this um, mm. because of the cost. And uh, people forget that they had a direct competitor called BSB, which had thrown something like $700 million at the time, which is in the early 90s, a lot of money, um, at the co uh, in competing. Uh, so they had a competition thing initially, and then once they merged Sky and BSB together, it was a little easier. I mean, I think the thing was... I think the thing with Sky was a genuine belief that the British public wanted greater choice. Mm. I also wanted innovation in, in you know, experience. If you look at football coverage back from the 70s and 80s, it was pretty, pretty dire. Mm. It was okay. There was like three or four camera angles, depending on which place you were at, and that was about it. So I think, obviously, Sky came in with a lot of crazy innovation initially, which they was criticized for. But actually, if you look at it now, it's pretty amazing. So I think there, there was a belief in the consumer. And I think that's the whole thing of, you know, if you're building a business, if you've got an instinct and an understanding that the, what the consumer wants, then that's, that's your North Star. You have to hold to that because particularly in Sky's case, there was a lot of costs 
both in marketing costs and in setup costs and everything else to, to get through. They were losing 10 million a week at one point? I think something, I seem to remember one time we were, ab- we were absolutely gobsmacking. I think we just merged with BSB. We just merged the businesses together. So both companies between them were losing money and then you just sort of doubled, doubled the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and it was crazy. Um, it was crazy, crazy money. Um, and there was a lot of you know naysayers going, this is never going to work. But I think there was always an inherent belief, both in the leadership and the people who worked there, that this is was going to work in time, and you just had to work it through. And I think the business strategy worked, and it just they just kept going. And they had they had some very strong leaders who really, you know, did the right thing. I mean, this whole idea. One of the things that people forget about Sky is that it's a fantastic retail business. That's what it is, essentially mm-hmm. a sales. I mean, and I think everyone in TV at the time were like, oh, what are they doing all this retail stuff for? Because you have to sell the brand into the consumers and tell them how they can get it easily. So I think that was good. I mean, the funding thing was one thing. Obviously, there was a you know vision that you know people wanted more choice. And this was a great way of distributing it. And then I think a, a simple business model that you, you become the platform and then you can work with other platform providers so you can create choice across your platform, which I think has been critical for their success. 99s when I remember we got Sky. Yeah. And it was that, it was it was what every kid wanted. Yes. And they went to their friend's house because you had that choice. You could see everything. You could scroll through. You also had Beehive Bedlam, which was an amazing game that you could play on the Sky. <laughs> I was going to be on both them. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yes. <laughs> that was pretty much why I wanted it. But then you got things like MTV Bass and it just opened it opened things up from having, I think we had cable, which had three music channels yes. to, to something else that had so much more. Yeah, so much choice. And, and, and also that sort of ability to, you know, move to recording and catching things without the, the pain of, you know, pressing the button on the video recorders yeah. which some some people remember i'm sure so you you were at sky for 10 years mm-hmm. in which you moved up to you I moved jumped up around to, yeah. i jumped around actually i mean i started just i started essentially working predominantly in pure ad sales and then it was like boom time in the late 90s when lastminute.com came out and all sorts of stuff mm-hmm. So I was getting a phone probably about two phone calls a day saying do you want to move to this job or that job most of them, this is before LinkedIn was a thing, right? Mm. So the noise that I had no idea what I was doing. So you could often get, you know, crazily high profile jobs that you think, hang on a minute, I'm not quite sure I'm ready for that. And equally very, one, the ones that probably didn't recognize my experience. And I eventually went, I decided I was going to move on. And I went to a dot com called sports.com, which is a great URL. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, if you're going go to go anywhere, you go to something that has a good good advantage on the internet. Does it exist now, sports.com? Uh, I don't know what's happened to it now. It, has long, it had a long checkered history after its um, demise, which we'll talk about. So it raised $100 million and went bust in two years, oh. which even by the time, the standards of the time was quite pretty excessive. But I think the thing that people forget was that the money was raised quickly in order to move quickly to a stage where you could IPO or sell on. Mm. So our investors wanted us to spend the money to create the infrastructure, to create the business justification. So it wasn't entirely crazy. Uh, And I ran sales and marketing across Europe for that business, which was fun. So I was a client on one side and I was running a sales team across Europe as well, which I hadn't done before. Um, very entrepreneurial business, but one that ultimately failed. And the, the beauty of that business is that we managed to go bust on the first day of the World Cup in 2002. And if you're a sports business, going bust on the first day of the World Cup is not something you really want to do because you spent probably the best part of a year preparing for the World Cup, which mm-hmm. we had because we were very football orientated. And then we were literally out on the street that day. I mean, no debate. I mean, the, the administrators were in... We barely had time to grab our bags and we were just kicked out of the office. And that was quite a brutal experience. Um, but one that actually led to my next career, which was actually building a business. This is your because, first time as a founder. Yeah. yeah. And you were sit, I was sort of sitting there and you don't have many moments in your career where you suddenly go, where suddenly everything's changed without really much. You had very little control over it. It was like, you know, it was, it was, it was a very fast car crash in this sense, and the sense that it just happened because um, there were, say, you know, 
there were discussions about how the company could be saved and it never happened. So I suddenly sat there and then I had a team who were also in the same position. And interestingly, so um, three of my team and myself sat around and we said, well, there's a, I had this idea and I said, look, why don't we do build this business around sport? And the team said, yeah, that sounds quite interesting. And then we came up with this idea, which we called the business we called Aura Sports, the idea we were adding something to a sports environment. And it was a B2B business helping sports rights holders make money out of the internet. Because one thing that we, even though we'd gone bust at sports.com, we all believe that internet advertising was on a growth curve. And this was 2002. I mean, Google was starting to become quite an interesting player then. I've got a question, because I think this is a really interesting moment, your decision to, okay, the company's gone bust, I've got no job. <laughs> yeah. You can get a few people together and let's start a company. So if I'm listening and I'm you know, at an organization and maybe I'm aware that so I might lose my job at some point or maybe not at all, but I'd like to start a company one day, Yeah. but I've never done it. What yeah. would you say to them? We've talked about this before. I mean, I think there's, a, there's an interesting thing here is that you don't realize your skills until you're forced into that situation to use them. Mm -hmm. I think lots of people in corporate jobs who will say they want to do job, do their own business should just do it because they probably recognize they have the skill. They don't recognize they have the skills, but they do have the skills. But the thoughts going on at that time are, oh, I don't know, finances, how am I going to earn? I've got children to look after. Yeah, I mean, I had, fails? Yeah. I had a young family. I had a mortgage um, and I took out a loan, which... <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, how much? So doubling down, uh, I think 15, 20 grand, something like that. So I can't remember exactly what it was. Took out a loan. And, and that loan was to do what? To give you something, to, a salary to support yourself? Well, yeah, it was sort of an investment but in, back into the business that we paid back as a director's loan. So we sort of gave ourselves some, sort of a, I wouldn't say fictitious income, but it was an income of, of, on one way. And then we didn't pay ourselves. I didn't pay myself for like 12 months. Um, did you have children at this point? Yes, I did. Young so kids. How did how did she manage? How, did uh, you well, I, beans, I always remember this. Um, so I said to my wife, "I'm going to do this business," and I said, "Well, one thing we're going to have to do is going to have to change the car because the car was a, a big gas guzzler, um, and she's a big car nut." So I went. I said, "We're going to have to change the car." So what we, was the car? It was a it was a Cherokee Jeep Cherokee, which oh, was a was, thing at yeah. the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we went and bought a Mercedes A-Class, really small car at the time. They're, I think they're a bit bigger now. And I, I remember- say Renault Clio. You well, no, but a bit, yeah, <laughs> there, was a, there was a slight compromise I had to do. But we actually went into the garage and we got a check and a car on the way back. And mm. my wife's looking at me going, when you, if you ever sell this business, we're buying a new car. And I'm <laughs> like, fine. Uh, and sure enough, we did actually, but when the, when the story ends. But um, yeah, so we cut back costs heavily. And actually, you know, people say to me, oh, well, it's really hard. I'm like, there are some costs you can cut back with your lifestyles, I'm sure. Um, but, and these days, I think actually there's a lot easier ways of raising money than we had at the time. I mean, we wanted to raise money, but we were like, we need to move quickly. We don't really have the time for it. And the VC market and also the, the small private equity market, private market wasn't really there. Mm -hmm. so we didn't really have a lot of choice I think if I was starting a business now I'd, I'd know where to go to get funding and obviously with the the various incentives the UK government provide on it on on it, entrepreneurship is a little easier but would you not feel that you know the way that you did it you I guess you you all kept 100% equity as as founders because you put your own money in rather than getting outside yes we, yes I, I think you know that's an, that was important to us as well that we 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 got the right sort of set up equity wise and then we could work from there um and we didn't have for two years we didn't have anybody really guiding us what we did which i think is from an entrepreneur point of view to your point it's sort of quite nice it's a nice way of being because having someone on your shoulder going oh go this way go that way particularly if they've come from a very sort of aggressive vc background can be quite distracting mm -hmm. and i think if you're an entrepreneur you there's a great book that I love, which is about the um, one of the British rowing eights and how they became Olympic champions, called What Makes the Boat Go Faster. And it's a great book about entrepreneurship, actually, in re reality, because what it's saying is don't get distracted. Just focus on the core purpose of the In their case was how do they win the Olympics? So anything that made the boat go faster was fine. Anything that was 
distraction from that shouldn't be shouldn't be given priority and i think when you're an entrepreneur you have to be that way and investors in some cases can be distractions um especially at those early stages so we were lucky we'd raised we raised our money we had our first client which was chelsea football club and we built that business up and after about four years um we got to about seven million dollar turnover i think it was and we had people starting a process about selling it uh, which was always the plan it was actually written into the original document i always remember that and someone said you know what's your plan with the business and we said well our plan is to sell it someday mm -hmm. um, and we all agreed that's founders and the thing i should say about my founders all three of them were women and so it, which i think these days would actually get a lot more credit than it did at the time because you know sports businesses then were generally pretty male and still are to some degree i think yeah. and not that i still work in it so i can't comment i don't know exactly but pretty male dominated um so to have a a team of internet people um so sort of internet experts which were predominantly female was quite an unusual mm. play so you get to the point where you've built this business yep the numbers are looking good mm -hmm. the track records there the clientele's there mm -hmm. it's time to sell you sell it to a familiar company <laughs> yes <laughs> slightly familiar how did that go did, uh, did you kind of speak to someone you knew at, at sky well or? they made a strategic um Back in the t the day when they f when we first started, Sky had relationships with some of the clubs. Anyway, they were building some of their websites, so we were a natural partner for them. Mm. And then they made a strategic investment in us into about two years in because we were looking to expand and we needed we needed a little bit of extra fuel to just fast growth. Always that thing. I think when you there's always a thing about being an entrepreneur, knowing when you're going to need extra help just to get to the next level. Mm. And we sort of worked that out after two years. We'd gone really well, but we needed a bit of extra fuel, I think, just to build the business out. So they'd been a strategic investor, but that didn't mean to say we had to sell to them. It just happened that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was just one of those moments where I think someone gave me a great piece of advice is if you're going to sell a business, you shouldn't be ready to sell. Mm. Because you're ready to sell, it's too late. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that's such a good piece of advice because you sort of need to sort of think, oh, well, can I make it any bigger? Can I take it further? Or you still have to have those a bits of a little bit of doubt. Because if you think it's all perfectly and ready, then you probably miss the opportunity. And when people start calling, that's a usually a pretty good indicator that you're, you're in the right place. That doesn't mean to say you have to sell right that moment, but it's sort of that time. So, yeah, and then we, we had three offers, actually, interestingly. So we had three offers from various companies. Sky was one. So I was put in a very challenging situation trying to manage three offers, including one from a, a, a shareholder, right. uh, which is an interesting. You know, I wasn't uh, not at all trained for how to do that, but I think we, we ended up in the right place. Um, and then we, we talked as a team about it, and we decided we thought that Sky was the right place to take our team. Mm. and um, that's where we that's where we landed and I went back to Sky as an entrepreneur which was a very different experience to what I'd done before because obviously everyone's looking at you going why did we buy this business yeah <laughs> walk us through the sales process for something like this well sales process I think for a small company selling to a big company is quite complicated because obviously they have their corporate governance and they have their lawyers and everything i mean I, I i never realized how many people who were going to be involved in this whether they were tax lawyers accountants whatever and then there's little us going well this is our excel spreadsheet with our business on and here's our accountant and it's you know it all makes sense right uh so i think it was quite a slow process and i uh and we worked we had a great great lawyer who was wonderful um who we worked with quite a way, way through from Oldswang and it was great she was great but she had this much clearer understanding of what we were walking into I think than we did we were sort of slightly naive thinking oh this will be done in a couple of months no way <laughs> <laughs> so it dragged it dragged a bit because of the number of people involved and you had to you almost felt like you were sort of being interrogated quite regularly about every aspect of your business and they were obviously making sure that there was no liabilities or no risk that they were taking on an absolutely right thing to do. But I don't think you're ever really prepared as an entrepreneur to go through that very 
administrative process mm. or checking process that it was, but... How long did it take? Uh, several months. I can't actually remember. I sort of blocked it from my memory because mm. it's quite painful because I remember my wife was going, you sold it yet? No, not today. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, it, it just took some time, uh, th probably three to four months at least, I think, something like that. Mm. How much did you make from it? I don't talk about that. Um, <laughs> but let's just say, I think it was, it was a, a great amount of money and, you know, for me and for my family and we'd done it was great stuff with it. But it, you know, I never did, I actually, and this will sound, I think this will sound slightly, some people might be a bit cynical about this, but they shouldn't be. I didn't do it for the money. Mm. The money thing was actually secondary. It was just one thing that many entrepreneurs will say is selling a business is just one of those validation points in your life, mm. which is really powerful because you created the idea, you took it from X to Y, and then someone else bought your idea. And that, for me, was the most important thing. The money, the money was wonderful. Don't get me wrong, but it's not the real, real motivator to me. Mm -hmm. um, because having come out of that moment when we were just sitting in a bar in Chiswick when we'd been kicked out of our, our offices four years ago, earlier, going, "What we're going to do?" to that moment, that was that was a wonderful journey. Mm -hmm. That's it. I mean, well, journeys is the key <laughs> yes, word I was about to say it but um yes it is it is about the journey mm. so what would you say to someone who has a specialism or expert knowledge in a field that suddenly finds themselves unemployed yeah it's a good question i think there's a lot of especially recently there's been a lot of i've got a lot of questions about this so i've um i've been to a friend of mine at google who just come out of google for the same thing i think the, the immediate opportunity is you you've got to recognize what value you have mm. Um, you built up skills over time. Those skills are useful to lots of people. Mm -hmm. And I think you can quickly work out whether there's a few opportunities in the short term to be employed probably as a consultant or a freelancer just using those skills. And uh, I think that's increasingly the way people are going to work in many ways with you know in this world. Um, as long as you've got the confidence and you recognize what your skills are and the networks you have. I mean, you know, for someone coming out of a, a big tech company, the knowledge of how that company works or the uh, people within that company who are important for decision making stuff is really, really useful information, mm. not easy to get hold of. But equally in smaller businesses or in, in, in specialized verticals, you know, there's a lot of benefits for people. So I think, you know, I, I, I never see people coming out of jobs and I, I've having have been forced upon me several times in my career as a problem you just need to be able to have the confidence to bounce back mm -hmm. and what i do say to people is get out there and talk to people um because everyone will give you time and you'll find out who the people are who are really helpful mm -hmm. um and those people who are not a lot of this helpful it's fine you just have to move on but those but networks and particularly things like linkedin and stuff can be really really helpful quickly and then you have to work out what you want to do and in my case you know, i came out of sky and I took a breath for a what for a few months, and then I just said, "Well, look, I don't want to do sport particularly. I mean, I did some sports consultancy, but I didn't really want to do it. I'd done the sports industry in the way I wanted to. I'd learned loads, but I wanted to find out more about other things. So then I worked more in the sort of advertising, digital advertising, and general management space, which I think was the right thing for me to do. And I started learning, and I did a short stint at Bauer, doing a whole load of stuff around." entertainment which was fascinating uh so that was you know that was my decision to take some of the skills i had which were mostly the ad skills rather than and not focus on the sports skills and then sort of move away from sport and into other areas um but that's just me right I, I guess i can i do that but i think if you're a specialist in a particular area i think there's there are opportunities it's just the, the thing i'd also suggest people do is find themselves a mentor if they're in that situation. I mean, I think they should mentors anyway. Mm. But if you have a mentor, a mentor can be very helpful. Just a sense check where you're at and give you some honest opinion back on things. I mean, I mentor, I currently mentor three people voluntarily and they're all different stages of their careers and they're all doing different things. But I think they do use me as a bit of a sounding board for should I do this? Should I do that? And I think if you do suddenly find yourself in a situation where 
you're out of work and you're looking for something, having a mentor might might give you that extra confidence. So it was after that period mm -hmm. um, that you started a company many people know, many people have in their pockets the products they make. Apple. Yes, which was fascinating. So I'd been at Omnicom. I, so I, I did my consultancy. I did a couple of years at Omnicom running digital just as I guess Facebook was becoming critical. We were running a sort of digital teams and I was... Um, and some of the Omicom friends of mine will to say this, I was sort of brought in to add grey hair to it. Um, I, think, I don't know if they had grey and balding at the same time, but that was one of the things. Because I think digital at that stage had grown up very fast, but it was still seen as a young person's activity. I think it still is to some degree, which is, we'll come on to later because I think there's a slight challenge with that. So I'd done all that, and then I was uh, running digital and having having a good time, and it was a great agency. And then Apple rang me up and said, look, do you want to come and run Europe for an iAd, which was their first ad business, not the current business that they run, which Steve Jobs had created before his death. And iAd was a very high value, high production value mobile advertising business. Um, and I was a little bit, mm, this sounds interesting. And then I met the team and I thought, no, this is really good. Um, and then I thought, no, I can't not. I mean, I'm a big Apple fan anyway at the time. And so I was like, I have to join. I have to go there. And it was fabulous. Fascinating business to work for. Um, you see, met Tim Cook? I met him very once, one occasion in a, when he came into a European meeting. Um, what did you, what did you see from Tim Cook that was interesting and what can people learn from him? What's, what's uh, I mean, I think the, I think gen, I mean, he is a very good example of a very um, detailed orientated leader. I mean, the thing about Apple is, is very, you know, it's a it's got a very great long term vision. It doesn't move. It doesn't do things just because it should. It does mm -hmm. things because it has a plan on it. Yeah. Um, and I always remember years ago when I was there, they were working on classifying classical music properly for the internet you know with stuff and classical music is really difficult to do right from a database point of view because you have composers and then you have the work and then you have the conductor and the mm -hmm. soloists and the orchestras and all the other stuff so it's from a data point of view it's a lot harder than saying Elton John did Tiny Dancer because that's easy right so they were working on this and I, and then I obviously left. And then a, a, only about a year ago, they released Apple Classical, which is their download, their app, which is all about classical music, which has solved all of those problems. And that's a very Apple way of doing things. It's took, taken that long, but they've you done it right. You left in 2014. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, 2016, 2016. 2016, sorry. So yeah, but, so I left in 2016. But yeah, they, all of that time, they've been working on this. Eight years. Yeah, mm. and it's a great app because they worked out what the, they worked, they knew what the problem was and they worked it through. And that's very... I think people will say, well, Apple's not innovative. I think, it, you know, especially when, when I joined, because Steve Jobs had just died, and everyone said, oh, Apple's all over it. It's never going to happen. You know, it, usual negative press about these things. And it is remains a very innovative company, but it innovates over, over time. And, you know, VR Pro and all this type of stuff is an innovation. They will learn lots from it, and they'll turn it into whatever they want to turn it into, mm -hmm. like they did with purchase of beats and where they go with headphones and iPods and all airpods and all that stuff so I, th I I really enjoyed my time there just learning how this business worked but obviously advertising is not core to what they do so um, and this goes back to this sort of you know entrepreneurship versus entre entrepreneur en entrepreneurship versus in entrepreneurship thing is that you're having to be a sort of entrepreneur within an organization trying to advocate something that isn't necessarily part of their big business now what they have is obviously apple search ads and search ads is obviously a big a big business for them but that's a that was very different to what they had with iad at the time and and you did work with a chap called eddie q and yes it was so eddie, eddie q is the uh i can't remember what his job title is now I but think he, he's ex ex senior vice president of service services yes. And his story, he's, he's a long-term Apple uh, guy, was a, originally, I think, Steve Jobs' IT support guy. Um, and so, he, for example, like when... Well, I think sorting out... Uh, from, uh, I think from the, the stories I've heard, and I, I, I don't know, but sort of sorting out his IT issues and stuff like that. New mouse. Uh, yeah, whatever. Desktop, but, but I think Eddie's broken. obviously gone into 
you know, running this very big services business and done extra incredibly well for that. And, and it was fun. But, you know, Apple hasn't had a lot of turnover at senior leadership for a long time. It's a very consistent group mm. around Tim Cook and Eddie and all the other guys. So it's, it was sort of fascinating to, to work in his organization and meet him a couple of times, which was fun. And just the, what are the things he worked on? Well, all the, basically the whole of the Apple service business in terms of services as in non-hardware, I guess. So iTunes. So when I was there, it was iTunes, then the launch of Apple Music. When I was there, um, so he was Apple Pay. So responsible for those? Apple Pay, which obviously is now, now an interesting business. Mm. Um, the move from downloads to streaming, obviously, which was you know pretty critical for that because obviously iTunes was the big player for downloads. Mm. Um and then I'm not sure what other services he looks after now, but the rain, basically the service side of the business, whereas the hardware side is obviously the, the, the core part of the business, but the services that come out of it. Was there anything you learned learned from him that was helpful in that time? You've applied to your life later? Or? I think the whole thing, I think that Apple's, I, I just, I, I think but it, the, the DNA is there with all of that leadership team in terms of one, the long-term thinking, um, doing right for the consumer um and you know i think understanding the outside the competitive environment but but still being true to what they wanted to do um i mean that was particularly true after steve jobs died because when i was there because obviously everyone was going oh apple need to innovate and they need to do this and this and they just shut the noise out and said no no we're just going to carry on doing what we do because we know customers like it mm. and i think that that whole group is very consistent with that belief of, you know, what the Apple brand is so inherent in all of those in that company. Um, it's very powerful in terms of how it works. And they teach, they have, you know, there's an Apple University. There's various things that happen within the organization to help you understand the Apple stories. I think the one thing I would say is that they weren't scared not to do something even though a lot of effort had been into things. And there's a couple of occasions which I saw where they suddenly said, no, we're just going to stop, stop on that project, move on. And I think one of the things with corporates often is that when it becomes apparent that something's not going to work, they keep going. Uh, and that's a really bad habit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the one, one thing about the tech companies generally is they're pretty good at going, that's really bad. Let's stop, you know, whether it's, Mark Zuckerberg with what he's done with the metaverse mm. or Apple, they're just general things. There were people who work on projects and they go, no, that's not going to happen. Mm. Um, and I think that's, that's a good learning from that organization. Definitely. And I think looking, talking about like their longer term view, I saw it was a couple of days ago, actually, like the patents to the goggles that they've got, they painted that back when the first like color screen iPods mm -hmm. came out and you know the, the the goggles are only coming out now 15 18 years later yeah, exactly mm -hmm. yeah so they, they they do have I mean it's the same sky this where's the ball gonna um, there's this great book by Ronald Cohen who's the guy who did Apex part looks called, called uh, the second bounce of the ball which is a great about entrepreneurship and the whole principle is this second bounce Where's the ball going to bounce second time is where really smart people, where smart businesses go. Because mm. the first ball, everyone like hangs around. The second, the second bounce, the first, sorry, the first bounce, everyone hangs around. The second bounce is the harder one to understand. I see. Mm. So while everyone's thinking about, oh, how can we make a, another version of the iPod or how can we make handheld devices, Apple's thinking about what goggles are we going to release in 2024? You know, and this, and this is in yeah. 2000. And, Five, but I, but I think equally all the big tech companies are good at that. I mean, Amazon will be thinking the same, and you know, um, in, in their own worlds and their own different ways. Um, but I think we're in a very short term world in some ways. But thinking long term is a little bit. I don't know. It's not frowned upon, but people don't really really rate it perhaps as much as they should do. Let's move on to a topic mm -hmm. of a, a superpower of yours. Yeah, dyslexia. <laughs> yeah. So dyslexia is interesting for me because I was never diagnosed as dyslexic. My kids are dyslexic and we don't, they were diagnosed at different times. But I sort of 
realized when I was a kid that I was struggling with reading. I wasn't a great reader. Um, and I think the assumption that back then was that, you know, I was probably a bit, wasn't that intelligent or whatever. Just it was a problem I had. I was also left handed. So there was a sort of, and even back in the 70s when I was at school, I guess, there was a little bit of a prejudice even against left handers. You know, they were called cack handed. Huh. Um, so there's wow. sort of these the weird prejudices that were there and dyslexia wasn't really talked about and then I guess over time I started to realize that there was something there that made me different one is I get my left and rights mixed up there's a lot of obvious things that you now recognize because of the wonders of Google you can actually see what you can do a dyslexia test in about three minutes now but back then no idea um, and I recognized I guess that I had to overcome that that challenge so I'm a massive reader now, but that's not an obvious thing that came from it, but it's something that, because I struggle so hard with it, I guess I take pleasure in the fact I can do it now and deal with it. I think the other thing with dyslexic people is their ability to see, join dots of things on a fairly macro level. And that's a really interesting skill, particularly when you're working in corporates or you're doing entrepreneurship to see how things work together so you can build strategies or whatever so I guess looking back on it I think it has been a superpower I don't think I knew it was a superpower perhaps until more recently actually um, and now I think the great thing is that people do talk about dyslexia much more and talk about the benefits of it I know Richard Branson talks about it lots of other you know entrepreneurial type people who are dyslexic talk about mm. it which I think is powerful but it's one of those things that just wasn't there. But then with my kids going through it, I sort of could see the challenges. We caught with my son, we got it very early in his in his life. So that was great. And he had a lot of help all the way through. My daughter, it happened a bit later for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's just, I think me being dyslexic, them being dyslexic, we sort of know how that works. Mm. How did you adapt your working style to allow <laughs> your strengths to play out in the workplace it's interesting because there are some places where i struck my dyslexia was a disadvantage mm. and there was not a lot i could do about it in other places is obviously i think where i flourish the best is when i'm being as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur where i'm building businesses and you know that's a strength having a dyslexia approach because you can see all the joins and you can work out how you navigate an organization small big large whatever mm -hmm. i think it's a very difficult when there are very very clear processes in place so i um we haven't talked about this yet but i have so i did spend three years at amazon now amazon is a very very they have this culture around documents mm. and this whole process is that the meeting starts with a reading of a document which is six pages long uh, there are clear restrictions on what you're allowed to say and do. You can't have any adjectives in it. It's all going to be data driven and all this type of stuff. This is this comes from Jeff Bezos. This it comes his... from Jeff Bezos. It's one of these big things about how you scale businesses mm. that you have this source of truth. It stops a really great salesperson influencing a room because you have to present the facts, not the best PowerPoint or the best keynote or whatever it is. Mm. And so, so then their meetings start in silence, basically, yeah. right? Well, we're well, not quite. I mean, they say the, the meeting starts with who, who's got the doc. The doc gets shared. And then we'll uh, start the meeting in 20 minutes once you've all read it. And you basically put your hands up. And we, we obviously, I did a lot of this in pandemic times for all video calls. You put your hand up and say, I finished reading. And then you would discuss the document and discuss the requests from that document. Now, as a dyslexic person, this is a nightmare. Mm. This is your worst Why? nightmare. Because one, dyslexic people can read, but they can't necessarily absorb in that short space of time. Mm. So six pages is a lot to read. And I'm quite a fast reader for dyslexic, but even I find found that struggle. But then the abs absorption of data is really difficult to do. So I often have to read things several times to really get into the data. And then within Amazon, you're supposed to, when the, the reading's over, you're supposed to provide insights or questions around the data. Now, for a dyslexic person, that's not, I've got no chance because I've got no idea. I haven't formed the opinion of the document in my mind within the time scale that I've been given. And that was really hard. And then equally, if you ever have to do your own document, and I did a couple of on occasions, complete nightmare the other way, 
because when you're writing documents, dyslexic people have this habit of dropping words and all sorts of things that you just, just don't see visually. Now you can say, oh, well, word has a grammar check, yes, but there are some words that sometimes disappear off. So your document doesn't look perhaps Polished. as good as others. Mm -hmm. And that, within that environment, was criticized often. So as a dyslexic, I found this really, you couldn't adapt. There was no, because the system was the system, you know, mm -hmm. doesn't matter how how much you could sit there and say, it doesn't work for me, it doesn't yeah. really, didn't really help. I get why Amazon do it, and I, I think it makes their business very efficient, but it doesn't really allow for variations in, mm. <laughs> in neurodiver from a neurodiverse perspective anyway. And with that, how did you go about discussing like dyslexia with your colleagues in the in these settings? I guess in most of my career, I haven't had to discuss it because it hasn't been a barrier. Mm. And because it wasn't really something that people did talk about. But I think with the rise of a greater awareness around neurodiversity and ADHD and all that type of stuff, then it's sort of come more prevalent. I did try and raise it at Amazon. It didn't really go very far. Um, because in that organization, which was well, 1.5 million people or whatever it is, it's sort of, this is the process. You have to live with it. Yeah. Um, which is a shame because I don't think that's the right thing to do, but then, you know, whatever. Um, but these days I'm much more open about it. And, it, and uh, you know, even with my team now at Uber, I would say to them, look, if I write a message and there's a couple of words missing, it's only not because, you know, I've been out the night before and I've completely forgotten what day of the week it is. It's more to do with the fact that I'm just, uh, that's just happens with dyslexia and just don't worry about it or whatever. And people, people don't judge i don't think they judge me on it at all in that way um that's it especially if people know if people are told and they know it's quite hard to tell people though i guess but if it's it's almost like it needs new branding it's almost like this is what yeah. makes me great at what i do yes it's sort of it's, it's yes you're right i think it's seen as a, a disadvantage not a benefit yeah and therefore I don't understand quite why companies don't necessarily embrace it more and say, actually, you know, this is a good thing, not a bad thing, because it would be beneficial. And it is also very interesting if in one part of my career where I was running a, um, an engineering team, there's usually quite a lot of correlations between really good engineers and neurodiversity, right? So you have to think about that. And mm -hmm. when I was running that, we did a lot of work around neurodiversity and making sure that we created the right environments for neurodiverse team members to be in there because ultimately that was, was important because they were great at their jobs. They just happened to have a range of new neurodiversity elements that we needed just to adapt a little bit to. So you've touched on it there, Amazon. You do move to Amazon in an interesting <laughs> format. I mean, it's, you, you join a company and then it sells to Amazon. Yeah, so I joined a company uh, called Seismic, which was um, owned by a private equity business. And it basically collected a bunch of ad tech companies together. Um, and uh, they all did various different things. One was uh, Seismic itself was predominant. The first part of that business was an ad serving technology. So the ability to place ads on the yeah. on the web. Um, then they also had a data business and they also had um, a, demand, a media buying platform as well. So they'd aggregated all these things together, including a company called Rocket, Rocket Fuel, which was quite high profile at the time. So they put all these companies together and they ran by a private equity company and I turned up to run Europe for them. And uh, this was 2019. And then after five weeks, I was in New York and it was um, called to New York for a management meeting, which was great. So I'd arrived in New York. It was one of those really cold, crisp days in New York and the sun was out and it looked amazing. And then we were told to go to, we thought we were going to the office. And when they, then someone rang us and said, can you just pop to this other place, which was a legal office? And I'm like, okay, fine. So we went into this amazing building, which actually, ironically, I discovered afterwards was the um, building where they did the first series of suits in, right? So it's fantastic views over, over everywhere in Manhattan. So we're up there and then we were told Ah, uh, slight problem. Seismic is now going into Chapter 11, which is a bankruptcy process in the US, which is not an administration. It's more a protection from creditors while you work out options for the company. But certainly after five weeks, I don't really think that was probably what I expected. On my, <laughs> It wasn't on my onboarding plan anyway, no. let's say that. <laughs> in, in your fifth week. The fifth we week, yeah. And then I said, 
uh, as a ring friends and stuff, I go, yeah, I think this is going to be quite interesting. And 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 I had a really interesting decision to make because I had no reason necessarily to stay because there was nothing there. I mean, I hadn't even passed my probation or anything. Mm. But I liked the team a lot that I was running in Europe, and I thought, well, let's see where this goes because you never know. And very quickly, we had lots and lots of interested parties coming in to try and buy parts of Seismic. And one of those was Amazon. So I was part of the team that sold it to Amazon and then moved the Seismic team for Europe into the Amazon organization. So that was fun. And then I suppose, and it sort of gave me an interesting purpose because managing a team when there's so much uncertainty around is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and there were stories and there was stuff in the press and there was stuff in Reddit message boards, all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff, right? Um, and someone said, have you seen this? And we really didn't have for about, I think this process took us about two months in total. There was two months where you sort of came into work, but you didn't really know what was going to happen. And <laughs> so what I did was created, we, we, we basically said, right, we're going to create a routine because you have to do a route. You have to have, you have to put some sort of routine back yeah, into the business. Otherwise all hell breaks. Right. Yeah. So we said, right, every morning, 10 o'clock, we'll have a, we'll have a meeting and we'll just talk about where we're at and all sorts of crazy things were happening. Like, landlords in various offices were being were basically trying to lock us out of buildings and all sorts because because everyone be, thought they weren't going to get their money they right? everyone thought they weren't getting their money mm -hmm. so you had this whole balance and then you had customers you know not sure what was going on and, and the business was still operational but challenging so we had this regular meeting every day and we got through it as a team because i think that was one of those look just keep everyone informed what's going on there was no sugar coating if it was a bad day it was a bad day i would update on where we were on the selling of the business and i think we transitioned pretty much out of that team about 90 percent of that team went into amazon at the end of it and they stuck around um and they could all easily have probably walked out fascinating time and then obviously went into amazon did did all the integrations um what did you learn about again any advice about selling businesses through your experience with selling to amazon yeah don't sell them in distress generally is a good, <laughs> a good don't thing sell them when in chapter 11 or <laughs> when in chapter 11 don't um no i think um I, th I think the interesting thing actually going back to the chapter 11 thing is ultimately what they you know when you're talking to amazon people they were just trying to work out what talent they were bringing in as much as mm. what technology they were bringing in and i think in that situation we we did a lot around the talent and the importance of the talent and Amazon was growing and still is as an ad business at the time. So there was a sort of, there was a hiring benefit to them as much as there was a um, technology benefit. So I think that was important to show that skill set because we had some great skilled people, a lot of them still at Amazon actually and thriving there. So it was, that was as, as important. So selling the people rather than just the vision of the business was I think important. So, yeah. yeah, makes sense. So yeah, we are interested on this show about how great businesses are run. So you spent some time at Amazon. Um, you became, let's just see, head of international tech business and development par yep. and partnerships at Amazon. Um, what did you learn about what are the great things of how Amazon is run that people can learn from for their own businesses? Um, Amazon is probably one of the best examples of how to scale businesses I've ever worked at. I mean, I think their ability to scale because of their focus on process. Mm. Is also focus on process. because of the document process and everything they have you know the, the the document process is consistent at all levels all meetings everywhere it's not just for senior leaders it's not just for you know so that means that there is that's the central point of decision making is a document is a central point of any decision making. they have various variations of documents they have a thing called a prfaq which is a future facing document so if you're trying to do a new project you create the press release of the project two years from hence, oh. which is a fun thing to do. So you basically say, well, this is what it's going to look like. And it's that sort of thinking about it forward and then working back, mm -hmm. working back from there. How do you get to that moment, which oh, yeah. is quite entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that works. So you've got PRFQ, you've got the main, your main documents. And then they have the, the, the leadership principles, which they adhere to a lot. The 14 leadership principles they have. I think they've got 14 or is it 16 now. They, they've added a couple. Do you know them? I can't remember them now. I mean, the, the the things like dive deep, which is a lot about data and the importance of data and diving deep into the detail. Um, 
was one that that stood out there's um there's a lot of other ones there's some ones around diversity and stuff they've added in but those principles sort of very much live in the organization so they've got this consistency all the way through uh and that's how they've been able to scale so effectively um through process and values process and these consistent values which they champion and all that type of stuff i think um and also i think an ability you know again back to the apple story i think their ability to say no to things when they don't work mm. um i remember being in seattle and we were at a uh, senior leadership training program that they ran and this guy came up and he talked about some of the failures he he'd worked on at amazon which is very powerful because at most companies you'd only ever talk about the successes and never yeah. talk about the failures but they talked about the failures and what they learned and he, he was he ended up running a very successful after the failures he talked about he then ended up running a very successful part of the business around logistics so it wasn't a problem failing it was a problem more i think the the thing that sh- should never have happened is not trying mm. um and i think that's a very interesting learning curve and so that's a that was good i mean that it it is a machine it is definitely a machine that place um and you know lots of good, my good friends are there and it's great but for me it was the dyslexia thing was a real problem for me and i just couldn't really make it work for me personally in the long run how is there anything around getting you know cuz there's one thing writing 12 values or writing some values and sticking them on the wall <laughs> or you know showing these are our values how do you get a company to really live those values to a point where it really helps the business well th- i think it goes back to two things one is in the documents the values are often highlighted in the documents and the way people speak so if people would say if they're doing a review of the document i would diving deep here or something if they took that di- they would actually use the phrase oh. as part of their discussion point mm, so that the other thing that happens is obviously when you get um annual reviews you get you know key values what do you what do you shine at what are your superpowers within those key values i see so it very much lives in the whole ecosystem of amazon employees you have to live with that i mean i think Amazon people who've worked at Amazon will learn an immense amount about how to run businesses um so it's a great great learning curve for all of that type of stuff and you know i think as you say a lot of people have values on the walls and then nothing happens afterwards mm-hmm. and then it sort of becomes a uh, an object of fun from employees doesn't it yeah that's great advice there get and that probably comes from the top if you get the top starting to say the values in what in their conversations in meetings in memos and stuff that's going to work and as as you said um doing appraisals based on on the on values, values is yeah. another great way to do it within your career journey and many different roles you've worked with many different people you faced a few few scenarios where you had to put up with some workplace bullying yep what would you say to someone who is experiencing bullying in the workplace? I've been bullied out of two jobs essentially. Um and it's a very difficult one because the problem is while I think there's a greater awareness of bullying um one it's quite difficult to in some cases prove because particularly now actually because a lot of bullying happens in one to one video calls or whatever else happens to be which there is no monitor for right mm. you know in 10 15 years ago people in the office it would be pretty obvious if someone was big bullying someone because someone would have picked it up but these days it's quite difficult to pick up so i think it's it's difficult to see i think the other thing is always the hr teams in lots of companies are there to protect the company not to protect the employee so bullying's one of those ones which is they're probably more likely to go with the side with the em- employer than they are with the employee it's one of those really because it's it's marginal it's hard to prove um and i mean i think it's a i think it's a really big problem that we have to deal with it's something we don't talk about um we and if people are bullied out businesses they often have to sign NDAs like I did and that's the end of it right so the outcome for for employee the 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 bully is actually not that significant mm. um 
therefore, I think the challenge is if you are being bullied, and I think you have to define what we think bullying is these days. I mean, I've had different approach. There's different ones in my history. I mean, I've had someone who completely tried to micromanage everything I did to the level where I wasn't me anymore and went through a very, very dark time for me because your confident my confidence was shot to pieces um uh, and this you know that was just not something i could cope with i was like everything i did was wrong literally everything i did there was no praise there was nothing i had been in this particular instance not particularly well on boarded so i didn't know what i didn't know and a lot of it was to my point earlier this was a one-to-one -one conversation which was just happening and then this person was then feeding up to other people saying, oh, this is not working out. And what kind of feedback are you getting? Like, how are they just saying, oh, that's, that's not very good? Or um, I was being told that my presentation style was wrong. Um, I mean, I probably presented more places than most people have. You know, I do a lot of stuff, <laughs> do a lot of talking in lots of places. So having that was quite difficult. Um, I didn't understand the product, which I did. Um, I mean, it was literally, it was micromanagement to a level where I didn't know where to turn. I mean, I literally didn't know where to turn because everything I did was wrong. Over what period? Because if this happens a day or two, okay, whatever, but... No, this was, this this sort of happened pretty quickly from when I joined until I left. So it was pretty long, it was didn't really change. Uh, and what, how long roughly? Was this, are you talking months? Probably about... Um, I guess, well, there's, there's a couple, I mean, I, as a, there's another occasion as well, which uh, both of these probably lasted a year, I wow. suppose, in some, in some ways. So it's, it's for a year you're being told, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is not yeah, wrong. Yeah, and I, I guess I'm a believer, I mean, I didn't want to lose the job, so that's mm. one thing. <laughs> and you think, well, maybe this will work out or something will happen. But in both occasions... I went to HR and they weren't bad. They were sympathetic, but they weren't effective. I think that's a difference. Mm. Um, because they they weren't empowered to be, I don't think. I mean, people didn't want to hear this story and they never do with bullying. I mean, it's like, oh, it's just a misunderstanding between two people um, as opposed to, in both cases, it was systematic they was clear they wanted the outcome that the both of these managers wanted was me not to be there it was very obvious to me um that's what they wanted and what does that feel like it's terrible it's just and particularly for someone like me who's sort of i guess battled a little bit with the dyslexia stuff mm. your confidence like anybody's is fragile to some degree and to be told it's sort of i think probably brought back some not yeah childhood elements where it was like i wasn't i just wasn't good enough um or i was you know i think dyslexics often get accused of being called thick or whatever because they don't do things in the same way or you're stupid because you get your lessons and rights mixed up all that type of stuff so it's a bit of that it was a bit of that sort of take you back to there and just lose lose your confidence and your your stuff and then it also the other things it puts a lot of strain on your relationships with others uh, particularly in the organization who obviously have to if they're reporting into these people have to have a their own bubble their own protection for their own things so they don't really want to hear about it so you sort of become a little bit of a prior in this sense and sort of, you know, further isolated away from where you're feeling isolated anyway, then you're further isolated and you're sitting there going, this is just horrible. Mm. Um, and I went through, you know, I just had to get, I mean, I went through a lot of therapy on the, on the second one in particular, um, just to try and get myself back to believe that I actually was capable and, and people used to say, I remember talking to a couple of people after, after this, and they said, well, you had such a great career, you shouldn't worry about it. It's like, yeah, but I think when you're in that bubble, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. So my advice is, 
I think the, pos the, the way of dealing with it is to try and get as many people aware of it as possible, which is really hard. But I think the more that are aware of it, the more it becomes an issue that can't be avoided. But if you can't do that, then I don't know what to suggest. I mean, I think, you know, if the company isn't going to take it seriously, you're in a really tough place. Um, I mean, again, mentorship and things will help with this. And I do think, you know, if you have a mentor, you have someone to release that pressure with. Mm -hmm. I didn't at the time, uh, which is sort of a regret of mine. I think it would have helped me. Um, but it's just... I just find it's one of those things which I think, you know, and as, as I said earlier, in this world of video calls and one-on-ones and all that type of stuff, there is so little management of these things. And there is this pursuit for perfection over doing. Um, and a lot of companies go, oh, you've got to get this perfect, all this type of stuff. And perfection over doing is, doesn't allow people to grow into roles necessarily because they're expected to be perfect on day one, right? That, that never happens. I mean, the way I work now, we have um, a clear view with anyone onboarding at Uber. First three months, we're just saying, just onboard, learn the culture, do the training, understand the products. Mm -hmm. So you get three months just three to months learn, just to no, learn. Yeah. no expectations. The expectations are just like, you know, just we'll do it in your own time, which I think is the right thing to do because we can't really, can I judge someone after two and a half months no mm. uh, because there's so much to learn and then the second six months is like build and grow and then we after that then we will say okay well you know that's the way it goes that doesn't happen at enough companies there's a lot of people i think particularly at senior level thrown in there and then they're expected to make an impact in like three seconds mm. being given very little support or stuff and depending on how who their manager is their success or failure is very much determined very quickly. Mm. And I think, you know, I think we as, I mean, I think the ad industry needs to deal with this. Um, I mean, I think there's another issue which comes into this in my case, which is age. So I'm one of the few people in the ad industry that's over 50, right? Which I think there's only 5% of the ad industry is over 50, which is ridiculous. Wow. Because if you think about the importance of over 50s and the whole purchasing of products and stuff is, a, is, is bizarre. Um, but being an old experienced person is also something that people aren't very used to. So that may also be a challenge for them as they employ people like me and then they go, oh, oh this is a bit hard. Um, whereas actually you should go, well, actually the loads of experience, maybe there's some value here. <laughs> That's mm. the whole point of doing mm. it. But it, yeah, it was one of the one of the saddest times. I mean, I don't sad in the sense that these people, these two managers, were just almost like myopically obsessed with making me fail, or use me as a example of their own failures, or blame me for a decision that they didn't want. They wanted to make, but they didn't want to put their hand up for. In your opinion, what? What role do leaders or should leaders play in pre preventing bullying and how could more measures be put in place to ensure that these things can be identified earlier? I think it's a, I think the first thing they need to do is just listen to their teams. The, you know, this stuff gets picked up pretty quickly. If someone starts joking about someone being a micromanager, you know you've got a problem. Mm. Because that whole phrase micromanager is not a positive one, in my view. Um... So I think they should, uh, I think there's this whole thing of calling it out. If they hear about this stuff, you have to call it out quickly. Um, and ask employees what their opinion is and then get to the bottom of it very quickly. I mean, not, I've got, I'm, my team's growing rapidly, but I'm always trying to connect with the team all the time, no matter what level they are, to find out. I think what tends to happen in a lot of big organizations is that the senior people lose contact with the people way below. And therefore, micro, all these micro questions and things just don't get picked up. Um, so I think that's the first thing. I think general, I mean, I would get more people on, you know, you have training called anti-harassment training, but uh, there's harassment and there's bullying and there's two slightly different angles there. I think the anti-harassment rightly is important around obvious things like sexual orientation, that type of stuff. I get that. 
but bullying is one of those ones that doesn't really get covered in those those sorts of trainings i think there needs to be something there and then i think um people just need to be highlighting it more it's a big it goes back to a little bit to the dyslexia conversation it hasn't really come up enough um and if you look at the challenges we've got with mental health and issues at work and all that type of stuff there's there's got to be a correlation good leaders will keep people engaged and keep their teams together and all that type of stuff and make sure this stuff happens there's that great book um have you read uh called the power giants by john amici who's the MBA star who came out and Harris leadership thing and he says culture is defined as the worst um behavior you allow an employee to have which i think is a brilliant way of thinking about it because if you allow employees to perform bullying bad bullying or harassment or any of that stuff any of that stuff that is the base level for your culture so i think we as leaders have to make sure that that base level is where we want it to be it's not a base level it's like this is what we expect and we're consistent about it and we keep saying it and we call people out if they do something wrong but it does require a little bit of a focus on leadership because again i think part post pandemic leadership training sort of gone out the window a bit it is much less of a priority from what i've seen and talked to lots of people about and leading now is more complicated than it used to be because you've got video calls you've got these opportunities for things to happen where they're not recorded mm -hmm. you've got lots of different ways people communicate that weren't there before the pandemic and that i think has not been adapted within our management approaches and i think that's something we've really got to deal with i think one thing i just wanted to pick up on there of what you shared was around leaders being pushed into positions and it becomes sink or swim because that is one of the very reasons why we started this podcast in the first place to demystify the pathway and assist more people in gaining more knowledge of the different things that are learned on the way up yeah and i think you know there is expectation when senior leaders come in that they're suddenly going to solve things and that's often i think the way a new senior leader is presented back to the organization mm -hmm. you know oh this person's going to come in they're great what does that mean? He's worked at Amazon. He's worked yeah, yeah, at Apple. Exactly. Yeah. He's, yeah. You know, you get all of that. And yes, the experience stuff is important. But really, we should be saying this person's coming in. They've got great experience. And we're not we're going to just onboard them for a period of time. And then we'll, you know, it, the role will evolve and we'll get clarity and all that sort of stuff. The expectations is often too high. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly if. The company has problems that need to be solved by the role which often is the case you know oh we're not doing well here so let's have a new client chief chief client officer or, or whatever else happens to be if you're not changing the rest of the culture of the organization it doesn't matter what the chief client officer does <laughs> they can stand there all the time they're still be on the titanic right so i think that's also a problem is that sort of overselling of things and then you know the linkedin post and all the other stuff that comes with it it's sort of so I think, you know, coming into organizations, my view is always my job coming into an organization is to build a rapport across the organization, understand what the problems are, and then deal with the problems, mm. not come in and go, hey, I've got this new job and I'm really shiny and fantastic and I'm going to solve all the problems, but, you know, it's all going to happen easily. It doesn't work like that. So I think we're at the time of Uber now, which yeah. is which you've <laughs> described. Your um, is a is a combination of all you've learned about building teams mm -hmm. and about setting a strategy, which you've kind of touched on how you do it there. But we want to delve into that. But how did the opportunity at Uber come about? The opportunity at Uber came about through um, just a couple of contacts I had. I was looking, I was looking to leave a previous job, and I reached out to. Um, Mark is the VP of Uber, who was my boss before a previous place, uh, to get a reference. It was that simple. And I said, look, I need a reference to this job. And he said, fine. And then then he pinged me and said, well, actually, we're looking for someone to do the UK. Would you be interested? Uh, and I said, yeah. And he said, look, it's a process. You know, it's a very clear process, Uber. It doesn't matter. You know someone. There is a process you have to go through. And he said, you've got to go through the process and stuff. And I said, OK. So I thought about it. And I, as you probably told in the last few minutes we've been talking, I like new opportunities and this is a new opportunity. Um, 
it's an entrepreneurship opportunity within an organization that's well established and is not an ad business let's be honest we're not you know uber is not an ad business in that sense there's a lot of education in the thing and i was like well this is interesting i met the team and i got a sense of the culture and the culture is really important to me i think now i ask a lot more questions about culture than i've ever used to ask which is a good thing i guess why is that one because i'm if I'm building a team, in this case, I think broadly, I obviously want to align with the culture and understand what the values are and make sure that those values aren't miles away from where I want to be. But also, if you're bringing a team in, you need to understand the culture so you can get the right team on board because there's no point dragging in people who are going to just completely fail in the culture because that doesn't mean say you can't be entrepreneurial and all that type of stuff, but they they've got to under, you've got to understand the things that 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 drive and big tech tamp companies have similarities in cultures but they have variations but the culture that dar our ceo has, has created is very very different to i guess to the previous culture that we've we you know we we had at uber which was very startup y and now we're in a much more mature business um and it's a very diverse culture we do a lot of work in lots of different areas we've done a lot of work we just still do a lot of work in ukraine around logistics um so it's a very inclusive culture. So the culture was really good. And I met the people. I love the people. So I came on board. And then my job has been to build a team from scratch. So I was employed this time last year when we were recording this. I was still the first employee. And now we're probably, I think, in London going to be around about 30 people. Wow. So that's quite fast growth, even yeah. by, you know, whatever, normal standards. And then... The reason is that London is obviously a big hub for us for a variety of reasons. Um, so building that team has been, it's an honor to build a team from scratch when you, you know, it is really, you know, you, you never forget the moments you build teams and it's such a powerful thing to do. But uh, equally making sure you build a team that has the right skill sets for the jobs we want, but also fits culturally and, and all the other things. And it's been a ride. I mean, you know, we, we've been building a team while obviously a lot of the tech companies have been reducing teams. So mm -hmm. I suppose we are sort of benefiting from the, the misfortune of the, those changes, but that's business and that's how it works. Um, and then we've just been trying to make sure that the teams are built and I essentially have three teams within my org. They all have the right skill sets and the right approach and everything else. So that's hiring. What about setting a strategy? Do you have a process for, because you've worked at a number of organizations where you've had to come in and, and be an <laughs> entrepreneur and build a department or build a business. Um, do you have a process for coming up with a strategy for an organization? And yes, I mean, I think the process, I mean, in my head, we sort of, the first thing you do is build a basic, and then and there's several things in strategy. One is building a relationship with the rest of the ecosystem, i.e. the rest of the Uber in this case, which is really important. Because this entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur or an entrepreneurial team within a new business, within an existing business can be quite challenging because everyone's looking at you going, okay, what are you guys doing then? Mm -hmm. And how does that work? And that was really important part. So part of the strategy is engagement, which is an ongoing thing. And you get into the meetings, you meet everybody and you build trust with that group. I think that's the foundation of any strategy because without that, it doesn't matter what else you do on the other side. And then the next strategy is to start getting proof points of what you're delivering um, in terms of you know activations, whatever, that show your value. Because again, people are looking at you through, through the glass going, well, okay, well, what are you going to deliver to this business and what does that look like? Mm. So in the case of Uber Ads, I think there's a couple of things that we, you know, what with our first, the first campaigns we ran and sharing those and telling people what we were doing and what the value was and all those types of things. Um, talking about the people we were hiring and where they were coming from, you know, and then building short term strategies. So each quarter is a strategy, essentially. What is in your first quarter, what your first thing was? Well, my first thing was hiring. That's all I had to do, right? So I I did about 100 interviews or something in some crazy time. But hiring the right people was the, my my most my biggest priority. And I told everyone, that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to try and do anything else until I have a team. We can't really add value yet. Mm -hmm. And then second quarter, we're still hiring, but then starting to prove, prove value. And then beyond that, as we start maturing, then starting to build 
structures and strategies around each individual team because as I said we have three teams but it is it's quite fluid it's and, and it requires almost to start again every quarter when you're building a team this quickly mm. because there's so much you learn in each quarter you go well hang on a minute that didn't work maybe you should try this and there is an Amazon principle um, I think it's got always it's, they call it always day one so they always think mm -hmm. that it's the first day. And I think it's quite an interesting way of thinking about things is when you're building something fast, you should always get, this is day one of the next period, of the next period, of the next period. And, and that's how we tend to think. So we- Why is that helpful? It just re allows you to reset regularly and just keep reviewing and keep thinking about where you've got to. Because I think sometimes you can build, I've seen some people build orgs and they they keep going down the wrong route because that's what they set out at the beginning of the year mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and they know. feel a bit would they feel a bit sort of like oh i'm not a good leader if i change direction yeah yes exactly it's that mm. sort of whole thing well we've set this out this is what we said in our annual plan and this is what we're going to do well yeah fine if that works but to be honest it really does there are always things that come along that buffet you which you can't anticipate mm. it's a great phrase planning is everything the plan means nothing yes mm. <laughs> But it's also that thing when, when I was an entrepreneur, it's like you write a business plan and you should always have it live and change it all the time because the business plan you write day one is not going to be the one you write on day 30 on day 50. And it's the same principle here, I think, is you, you have to just be adaptable. And that's a little scary sometimes, I think, because you have to admit what's gone wrong more as much as what's going right. Uh, you have to probably make some tough decisions on... Have we got the right org structure, the right people in the right places, all that type of thing. But it is an energy. It does give you an energy to an organization if you have that. And I think it also allows for a much greater collaboration between the leadership and the team because they can provide feedback that you might well act on mm -hmm. rather than, you know, whatever. And then, you know, I know that people are talking about this like leaders as servants, but they, we, they, you sort of are in this instance because you've got the people out there going to finding out what's going on and giving you feedback. And then you can then, as a lit servant leader or whatever, try to change your strategy accordingly. Um, and we'll be changing it for ages. I mean, there's so much we're doing, but there's also so much we're learning. Um, and that's, that's the fun part of it, I guess. So Uber has disrupted traditional markets. Mm -hmm. And based on your experience, what can entrepreneurs learn about market disruption and creating a new demand? Well, I, th I think it's not just Uber. I mean, a lot of the big tech companies have disrupted things um, in different ways. I mean, Google disrupted the whole classified ad business. Um, I think the thing about disruption, I think it's not just about disruption, it's about processes, it's about evolution of business models. I think that the thing that, Yes, this technology has allowed us to change things, but it's then creating business models that support that idea and make it work. Um, and that's very, that's the disruptive bit, I guess. Um, and I think these companies just have a longer term view. We talked about it earlier, they have their longer term view and they, they like, they work out where they're gonna get to and then they create processes to do it. And I think, the interesting thing I've always thought is uh, all, all throughout my whole journey in digital, digital was a real disruptor of things and it still is because I think a lot of businesses haven't really recognized the impact it's having in the way they, they've done things. A lot of traditional businesses are still sitting there going, oh, digital, we've got to have a digital strategy. I'm like, digital is everywhere. It's not a strategy anymore. Mm. Um, whereas I think these companies are digital and Uber is obviously one of them, they're inherently digital by their de their design and therefore they understand how the world is working. Um, and I think entrepreneurs, if you're not digitally focused in entrepreneurship in some part of your business, then I would question where you're gonna go in the future. Mm. Um, but it's, all of the companies we've talked about have all created their own approaches, processes to achieve things that drive efficiency i mean a lot of these companies are not big employers relative to the scale of their businesses 
So they've created great efficiencies with their business plans. Um, and their ability to scale is probably the key thing is how do you scale relative to people and resource? And if you're an entrepreneur, that's the one that I would think that's probably the biggest learning. Mm -hmm. Learn from those companies of how they scale without having to have 50 million mm -hmm. employees or 50 million investment or whatever it happens to be. Um, because you can do that because of the network effects of digital digital platforms is just there. How so? How is that done? If I'm listening to that, okay, right, I need to focus on that. Your access to consumers is driven and the, in the digital world now. The access to consumers is far greater than it ever used to mm -hmm. be because you know if, you, if you're if you're selling something in a retail world when I grew up, you know you'd have a store and that would be it. And then next came along and started doing mail order. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, but that was really, so you have a store. Now your store is global mm. or your B2B business has a global opportunity. So you've got all of that opportunity, but we're relatively low cost to reach in comparison to the world that we were in. So for any business, any entrepreneur now, the opportunity, whether it's AI driven or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's as big as you want to make it in terms of the market you can potentially access. And that, and then you have to have a process of how you scale that opportunity to wherever you want to take it. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Talk, talk to us about being a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, this is one of those books I, mean, I, I, when I mentor people and I also do some speaking stuff, I always talk about this book because it's fun. And I think if you're ever going to learn anything in life, having an element of fun that usually helps. So it's fun. It talks a lot about, I mean, it's entrepreneurship, but, but it also, this idea of being a pirate, the pirates were a really interesting group, right? Because just, Sorry, just say what the book oh, is yeah, and who sorry, it's by yeah, first. My, yeah, the book is called Be More Pirate and it's by Sam Conniff Alande. And it's been around for a while, actually. Um, and it's just a book about all sorts of things, creativity, entrepreneurship, all sorts of things. There's a lot of different elements to it. But the essential, the essential thing is that if you're more like pirates, you'll, do, you'll, have, you'll have a very interesting world because you're basically, the pirates were trained, most of them were trained by the Royal Navy. So they weren't completely out of kilter with the world they'd been trained by an organization and then they took what they they learned and then they adapted it to their own cultures they're just not, they're not just mavericks that jumped on a ship and said Let's no go. they're not they're not just johnny depps who just appeared from nowhere right so um and i think that's important to understand is that and we were talking about this with entrepreneurship as well and you know people losing their jobs everybody is sort of been trained the Royal navy is where you've been trained i guess mm. well it doesn't matter who it is that's the, yeah. the allegory and then you can go out using that training and do other things with it and i think you know being all the experiences you have no matter whether they're successes or failures are really valuable and that's your real that's your super strength and then you can go out and use those things in the real world when you need to so i think being a pirate is quite a nice way of thinking about entrepreneurship and and entrepreneurship to many ways because it's a good you've got that experience from somewhere and then you're just applying it again and mm. learning from it and adapting it and evolving which again going back to what we were just saying about you know the big tech companies and everything else they've sort of been pirates because they learned their skills from others right apple learned its skills from hewlett packard and from those businesses and then adapted accordingly mm. google learned from Yellow Pages and all the other people in those categories that actually classified advertising was a pretty big place to be and it relied on a, a sort of element of search. Amazon learned from retail, you know, so they had all the skills, they then just took it to a new place and then sort of pirated it in, in, the, in the digital world, right? Mm. I want to lastly touch on AI. <laughs> a lot of people are talking about it. Yeah. We haven't actually talked about it no, at we all haven't on, actually, this no, we haven't. on this show, actually, in, in all episodes. But you ha you shared with us an interesting perspective on it, which I think was quite helpful to hear. What do you think people can learn today about AI and the use of it and their plans for their business and organizations or departments and and the the 
from what you learned from digital when that came about? Well, we're definitely in the hype cycle. I think that <laughs> goes without saying. And the wonderful Gartner hype cycle is certainly working for AI very well. So we're in the hype cycle, but AI is a little bit different in the sense that a lot of people have been using AI for a long time. It's just been hyped more now. I mean, AI and machine learning has been running for a lot of a lot of businesses for ages. So it's not like it's new. Um, obviously, ChatGPT and those platforms are new and they are changing in some things. But I think the thing for me is, I'm, I think outside of what, you know, traditional businesses and many businesses use AI to, to, to improve their processes. That's fine. The question on these types of AIs like, you know, LM, LLMs and all that type of stuff is, what business model are they going to create that comes from it? And what is the benefit to users? Yes, everyone. I mean, I've seen someone did a CV recently. I was talking to someone. They said, well, I've just tried a CV on AI. And oh, my goodness. I mean, it just didn't feel like a human had written it. Mm. It felt like brochureware on acid. I mean, it really mm. was crazy. And this is the thing. It, so what's the model on this? Because it's like, if I'm going to use AI, it's got to, I've got to have a benefit. Yes, you can have some fancy creative art and all that type of stuff. So I do think there's a sort of this hype around LLMs, which we haven't quite worked out what it is. I also think, I saw some survey recently that said that only about 5% of people in the UK have actually touched AI properly and chat GBT. So there is a danger that there's a group of us who are all talking about AI, but actually we're not really representative of the real world, uh, which happened with digital actually when the early days of AOL and all that type of stuff, everyone's like, the internet's coming, it's going to be great. But actually, the number of people who are actually online at home was a really small number. So we're in that same moment, I think. Mm -hmm. But that that being said, there's obviously a lot of investment going into it. There's a lot of fast track stuff that will happen. But I still don't know whether we found the... There, what's the business that's going to transform, use AI to transform into a, the next Google or the next Amazon or whatever? Is that going to happen or is it going to be very much the network effect is that the Googles and Amazons and people who have the large customer bases will benefit the most mm. from it? I don't know. Um, all I definitely know is that if if I go to a, a marketing conference and I don't see a panel on AI, I'm obviously in the wrong <laughs> year uh, <laughs> because it is the thing to talk about. But I'm still... I'm still unsure what some of these models mean outside of what they do mean to businesses just using AI to improve how they, they use their machine, how they use computing. I mean, that's been there forever, right? And should, in terms of strategy, should I change my whole business for, <laughs> for, for AI because it's the future or? No, because I, I look, I think, I think that, I think everyone should, exp I always think everyone should experiment and learn and do stuff because that's a really important part of, being human and that's important but i wouldn't say everyone has to suddenly pivot their whole business to ai it goes back to this point where we were talking about you know the focus on if you're running a business focus on what you are trying to achieve and stay on that and bring in technology you're obviously working with a lot of technology anyway bring in new technology and test it and see whether it benefits but if it doesn't it's not the end of the world it shouldn't be a distraction and that was your story of how you became head you. of Uber Ads in the UK and Ireland. And um, now we get on to your final poem, which Ash has been writing as we go. Oh, he's been writing as we go. Yes. All right, cool. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. There we go. <laughs> to be clear on what you want to do can lead you further on your journey. To having the right opportunities open when you believe in yourself truly and firmly. Entrepreneurship to entrepreneurship and back and forth between the two. The strive for development and growth doesn't cease for Paul. That much I can say is true. Knowing your competition and decisions data-driven can help you surf on the waves of uncertainty. Being aware of when things fail, eyes sharp on the details, ensure your choices are made purposefully. To now be in a space where post and past experience plays a big part of how he'll lead his team in a new and uncharted direction, providing value at speed and refining how you lead to build a new team for the industry to see and take mention. Thank you. That's lovely. Thank Thanks you for so joining us again. today. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you.